Good evening, everyone. This is Tuesday Night Rheumatology. Hi, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. This week on Tuesday Night Rheumatology, we're doing Room Now Live 2023 replays. And in this session, we're going to hear content from our second pod or session called The Modern Management of Psoriatic Arthritis. We have three amazing speakers for you. Dr. Laura Coates from the UK, Eric Ritterman from Chicago, and Christina Chambers from uh, UCSD in San Diego, who are going to lecture us on updates in psoriatic arthritis. In this replay, you'll hear uh, 15 minute or so excerpts of three great talks on remission, JAK inhibitors, and pregnancy. If you wish to listen to the full talk from these speakers, you can find the full 30-minute talks on, and also the panel discussion with Q&A with the audience uh, on the Room Now website and also on our Room Now YouTube channel. We want to thank Avvi, the sponsor of Room Now Live, our prime sponsor, for sponsoring last week's session on rheumatoid arthritis and this week's session on psoriatic arthritis. So let's start with our first talk. So we know that psoriatic arthritis is a heterogeneous condition. Patients have different domains that are involved. And so between one patient and another, they look very, very different. So the way we treat them and the way that we assess them is crucial to make sure that we're picking up active disease and making sure that when we define remission, we're thinking about all of these six different domains, the skin and nail disease, and then the musculoskeletal disease, in arthritis, enthesitis, dactylitis, and axial disease. And it's complicated because most patients have an overlap of multiple domains. There are a few patients who may just have skin psoriasis or may just have arthritis. But as you can see here, the majority of patients have two domains shown in the red, three in the green, or four in the orange. So most patients are presenting with multiple domains that are active and that require treatment. So if we're going to assess remission, we need to assess all of those domains to make sure that the disease is under control. So what is remission in psoriatic arthritis? So I thought I'd start by asking you. Um, so how would you define remission in psoriatic arthritis? Is it a low impact of disease so that patients can participate normally in their work and their life and hobbies? Is it linked to swollen joint count? Is it having no active swollen joints? Is it controlling both tender and swollen joints? Is it a complete absence of disease activity with ongoing DMARD therapy? So allowing ongoing treatment, but assuming that all disease is controlled? Or do you think remission is complete absence of disease activity without any ongoing treatment? So a drug-free remission. Or is it just an absence of joint disease with minimal skin disease? So I think you can argue for a number of those definitions in terms of remission. But this is the one that I first looked at when we were developing outcome measures in psoriatic arthritis and have used as a benchmark moving forward. So it says that clinical remission in PSA can be conceptualized as a complete absence of disease activity with no signs or symptoms of active disease. And it requires that to be true across all facets of disease or domains of disease. But I, I do think in my clinical practice that this definition would allow for continued treatment. We can talk about a drug free remission, those who hit remission without medication, but I would also include patients who are in remission on ongoing treatment if required. And that comes from a paper by uh, Artie Kavanagh, uh, well known to the Room Now community, uh, and Yup Franson, um, now from 2006, so a while ago. And I guess our first question is, what do the patients and the clinicians feel is remission? And I think we know and have known across multiple diseases for some time that the opinions of patients and clinicians often differ. 
So this slide looks at prevalence of patient physician discordance. So where you see a patient global and a physician global that are markedly different. And you can see that's present in 50 to 60% of psoriatic arthritis patients and a similar proportion in AXPAR and in rheumatoid. So it suggests that we are thinking about different things when we measure disease activity. And if we look in that a bit, in a bit more detail in psoriatic arthritis, you can see why. So on the left hand side, if you look at joint disease, you can see that the majority of what the physician considers to be active disease is indicated by tender joint counts, swollen joint counts, and a little bit by pain score. That last green block at the top are the things that we can't measure, that we couldn't identify in the principal component analysis. However, in contrast, if you look at the patients, you'll see there's still a block that we can't really identify. But the biggest thing that drives their opinion of a global disease activity is pain and fatigue. So it's more about symptoms and impact than joint counts. And that's similar, really, when we think about the skin disease as well and the psoriasis. So here you can see there's a bit more um, unexplained factors shown here in the green. But when we think about psoriasis or skin disease activity, you can see here that physicians are heavily influenced by the PASI score, how red and how widespread the psoriasis is, whereas the patients are influenced, again, much more on how it impacts on them, their quality of life and the pain. So when we look at defining remission, there's a very different concept that clinicians and patients are bringing to the table. And this is data from the REFLAP study. This was a study across multiple countries around the world looking at the definition of remission and low disease activity. And we performed a principal component analysis to look at how patients define remission. So this was just to identify those patients who felt that their disease was as good as gone. And when we looked at the different components that explained that, you can see that lots of things come into it. Joint counts, psoriasis scores, age, CRP, lots of different things come together. But by far and away, the biggest influencer there is disease impact. It's pain, the PSAID questionnaire, the impact of disease questionnaire, and the HAC, which is a measure of functional ability. So it's much more to them remission about what they can do, not necessarily about inflammation in the joints, as I think it's understood more by clinicians. So what are the benefits of remission? Is there any point in aiming for remission? So I thought I'd first introduce you to one of my patients. This is Joanne. Um, she lives and works in Oxford. Um, she uh, has a job as a cake decorator in one of the fanciest cake shops in Oxford. It's definitely where you would want your cake to be from. Uh, and she has psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. And as you can see here, she has quite active disease. She's got polyarticular disease, a lot of it in her small joints. And that has a big impact on what she can do. Um, when she's doing fine, fiddly things with cakes, that's a big issue for her. She's also got relatively active psoriasis, although not active to the levels that a lot of dermatologists would see. So at the worst end, I think, for some of our rheumatology patients. Now, if we can get a 20% improvement in her joints, if she can achieve an ACR 20 in a trial, the most common trial in most of our drug trials, um, then you can see that there's a significant reduction here in her outcomes but she's still struggling. This is not necessarily where you would want to be uh, if you were in her shoes. If we think about a 50% improvement, that's obviously a lot better. You can see things are moving in the right direction, but there's still a fair amount of disease activity. And so just having that improvement actually is not enough if you want to get back to normal life. If you can achieve minimal disease activity or very low disease activity, that's when you can see that lots of things are under control here. So her joint counts have come down to pretty close to normal levels. We've got good control of her psoriasis and her patient reported outcomes. So you can see the impact and the activity are relatively low if we hit these high bars that patients want us to achieve in studies. <laughs> 
And it's clear that if patients do achieve minimal disease activity, if their um, arthritis, enthesitis and skin disease are well controlled using the MDA criteria, that translates to better quality of life. So this figure shows the PSAID questionnaire, the impact of disease questionnaire, um, which is really, really useful in clinical practice. And this is data from a clinical study in the UK. And you can see here that those who are in minimal disease activity in the blue have low scores in all of these different domains in the 12 different questions within the PSAID. Whereas for those who are not achieving MDA, there's much higher scores across the board with those 12 different questions. And what about joint swelling? So it's not just about disease impact. If we can get people into remission criteria or minimal or low disease activity criteria, you can see the impact. So this is data from meta-analysis. Uh, and what you see here is that patients who are in remission are shown in green, uh, low disease activity in blue, and then the non-remission, non-low disease activity, so moderate or high, uh, shown in the orange or the red. And you can see here, there's a clear separation with low joint counts across the board of these many different studies, seeing if people are achieving the remission criteria. And again, that translates into patient impact. So if you look here at a patient pain score, you can see that those who are in remission in green have very low scores. Those who are in low or minimal disease activity in blue have pretty low scores. But those who are in high or moderate disease activity are significantly higher in the red and the orange. So there's clearly a strong correlation, which we would expect between disease activity and disease impact. But that doesn't really tell us whether an intervention can make a difference. What it tells us if, is that those whose disease is under control have better outcomes. But can we actually influence that? Can we intervene with patients who have active, more severe disease? And can we get them into a state of good control? And that's what we looked at in the TACOPA trial. So the TACOPA trial looked at treat to target in patients who are newly diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis and those in the tight control arm were seen every four weeks aiming for minimal disease activity. And that study showed a quite clear benefit for arthritis outcomes like ACR20, for psoriasis outcomes like the PASI, and for impact or function outcomes like the HAC, that tight control could show superiority over standard care. So having a treat to target approach where you aim for remission or low disease activity can really make a difference to patients with psoriatic arthritis. And that's not just linked to the drug that you use. So this is looking at the data from the TACOPA trial in terms of the drugs that these patients ended up on. And you can see here in the tight control group that more patients did end up on biologics, shown here in the yellow over the first year of their disease. But you can see actually a good proportion of patients in the TACOPA trial achieved MDA either on methotrexate alone or on combination DMARDs. Um, and so there is a benefit not just to the type of drug that you use, but the approach that you use in clinical practice. So is remission attainable? I'm going to start by asking you. So if you think about remission, in your patients, having that very good level of disease control and absence of disease, albeit on some treatment if required, how many of your patients do you think achieve remission in your routine clinical practice? Would it be less than 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, 50 to 60, or over 60% of your patients achieving remission? What about if we change that to low disease activity? So I'm sure all of you are aware that remission isn't always feasible, particularly in patients who have very severe or long standing disease. But sometimes we look for low disease activity as well. So if we change the question slightly and we're thinking now about how many achieve low disease activity and remission. So anybody who's in a reasonably good state 
How many of your patients do you think that would be? And the categories are the same as before. So less than 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, 50 to 60, or 60% or more. So one of the things we looked at in that meta-analysis that I've shown you graphs from already was at least 27 different studies that looked at remission and residual disease activity um, in psoriatic arthritis. And these studies are all from real world data sets. These aren't clinical trial data sets, but you can see that included over 5,000 patients with psoriatic arthritis. And there's a big variation across the studies. It depends what measure you use of remission or low disease activity. It depends what your patients look like. It depends whether they have early disease or late disease, whether you run a, a secondary care service or a tertiary care service. But overall, across all of those studies, we saw that the percentage of people achieving a target was between 12 and 43 percent. So it's variable, but it's still below a half. Um, in routine cross-sectional studies. So it's clear that there's still more for us to do to get disease fully controlled. Move on to some data, let's talk about this. So this is where it started. This was the um, pivotal trials for tofacitinib in psoriasis, just in skin psoriasis. Um, and it's, um, you can see that compared to the placebo, which is in a white box, sort of buried at the bottom that are almost zero, it worked. There's absolutely no question about it. And this is looking um, at a PASI 75, and I can't remember what the difference of the two, but they're, they're basically PASI 75, oh sorry, it's two different trials. PASI 75 results in both trials. And what was interesting in this was that numerically at least, the higher dose, which was 20 milli 10 milligrams BID at the time, 20 milligrams a day before we had the extended release, was the clear benefit and a clear dose that worked the best. And when they took this drug to the FDA, the FDA said no, because they didn't see enough benefit at the 5 milligram BID dose, the lower dose, and they were concerned about the safety data at the higher dose. Okay, And Stanley talked about that a bit earlier, and the concerns about safety with all of the JAK inhibitors, there's very clearly a fairly narrow therapeutic window before you start to get into toxicity issues, which is why all of the drugs that we use in our space in the U.S. were all approved at the lowest dose studied that gave a reasonable clinical response. So here's tofacitinib in psoriatic arthritis, and they did two pivotal trials there. Here's the DMARD inadequate responders, and what was nice about this trial is they threw in adalimumab as a comparison arm, not a control arm, because they didn't statistically compare it to adalimumab um, as, a, as a, an active control, but it was, a, it was an active control just shown for a point of what does that do, and the answer was that tofacitinib worked um, pretty much as well as adalimumab for joint disease. And you can see on the left um, the ACR response and on the right um, HAC response, health assessment questionnaire response, all better. And what you're seeing is the ACR 20, but the ACR 50s and 70s mirrored this. Um, there was some skin response, similar to adalimumab, but it wasn't clearly statistically better than placebo, and especially when you look at TNF inadequate responders, um, the skin response at both doses was non-significantly better than placebo. And so I think this goes back to the early psoriasis studies, which say you can get somewhere with tofacitinib and skin disease, but you kind of really have to push the dose, and it's a dose that's not tenable right now in the U.S., given the landscape around these drugs, and then and knowing that we're using the 5 milligram twice a day, or now the 11 milligram extended release. Okay. Um, mentioned earlier, but filgotinib, boy, that's a pretty impressive ACR response there on the left. They were headed down the path for psoriatic arthritis before they pulled the drug, and I suspect, and I think I agree with Stanley, that a lot of it was this was going to be the fourth to market in this class. They looked at their data. The hook for filgotinib was that potentially it was going to have a better safety profile than the other jackanibs. 
Um, that wasn't 100% clear from the studies, maybe a little bit less disaster, but at the end of the day, I think they just made the business decision to say that the safety difference was not going to differentiate the drug enough, and it's challenging enough in a crowded um, landscape, therapeutic landscape, to come in with the fourth drug to market in a particular class without having a specific benefit. Um, so it never went any further, but it worked. And then finally, upadacitinib. Okay, and this was the second drug approved for psoriatic arthritis from this class. And here's the data from the two pivotal trials of the patacitinib. So on a, on a, here you have PSA1. Um, these are people who are DMARD failures or NSAID failures, and they were randomized, um, I'm sorry, they were all DMARDs failures. They were non-biologic DMARDs, and they were randomized to the two different doses of um, adalimab, I'm sorry, patacitinib, because at this point it, it, it wasn't clear what the dose was going to be necessary, the 15 milligrams daily dose have been improved for RA, not clear if a higher dose is going to be required in psoriatic arthritis, adalimumab as an active control, but not the primary comparator. And again, drug was very similar. And here, actually, the PASI response is a little bit better and clearly distinguished from placebo. And so here you have a drug that, unlike in tofacitinib, where there was some skin benefit, here the benefit was statistically significant, both here in the bio-DMARD naive and here in the patients who had failed the biologic DMARD, mostly TNF inhibitors, but some IL-17 inhibitors. And again, no adalimumab comparator here, uh, but you can see the skin response down there in the bottom left, which gives you some comfort that this is an option in patients who have active joint disease, um, but at least some skin disease. Okay. And then to go a little bit back into the, the backstory and the science, we all kind of know the pathway that JAK inhibitors work. We know that cytokines signal through a variety of cell surface receptors that drive what they're doing in their target cells. And for many of these cytokines, they signal through this JAK stat pathway, that the receptors on the cell surface is a JAK dimer, two different JAK kinases. Um, sometimes the same, but often a heterodimer. Those undergo a conformational change. They stimulate stats, which translocate that signal down to the nucleus and turn on or turn off whatever they're going to do and activate that cell. Um, and what's become very clear is that this whole family of jacks on the cell surface a um, number of different cytokines signal through different members of this family. As I mentioned, met, much of the time these are heterodimers, okay? And what shakes out when you look at this is the second one in from the left, and you see IL-23. So we've seen very clearly the IL-23, the benefit of IL-23 inhibit inhibition in psoriatic disease, approved now for psoriatic arthritis, but amongst the best biologics seen so far for skin disease, and it turns out that IL-23 is one of the few pro-inflammatory cytokines we've been busy targeting with biologics that actually signals through the jak staff pathway in a way that we can demonstrate, and what it signals through is a heterodimer that includes JAK2 and TIC2. Well, that's not a jack. It is. It's actually sort of the fourth jack. Um, and I have no idea why it ended up being called tick instead of jack four, but it's tick two, and that's the fourth member of the jack family. And if IL-23 signals to that, you can imagine that inhibition or blocking tick two might actually have some particularly useful benefit in psoriatic disease because we know that it blocks a cytokine that's really critical in psoriatic disease. And we've seen that as we've developed biologics. It's this whole TH17 pathway, and it's IL-23 that drives the that pathway far upstream at the beginning of the pathway. And so you can imagine if you had an oral drug that blocked IL-23, that'd be pretty darn effective potentially in psoriatic disease. And lo and behold, it was. So now approved for psoriasis, for skin psoriasis, these are the two pivotal trials of ducravacitinib, the first available TIC2 inhibitor in the U.S. for plaque psoriasis. Um, they did a really smart thing. They used as a comparator, it was, a, it was the trial was powered against placebo, but they threw in a premolas as a comparator because they knew the audience they were speaking to. Dermatologists love a premolas. It's oral. It doesn't require laboratory monitoring, and it's pretty effective without significant inhibition or blockage of the immune pathways, immune system. And so the dermatologists love this because it's kind of a no-brainer for them, and it doesn't get them into the weeds that they had to worry about with some of the other biologics or with methotrexate that they never liked because of the monitoring that was required. And when you compare this to um, 
On Premalast, you can see when you start looking at PASI 75 results, which is the um, result that the FDA uses to approve a drug, the drug was very effective. In phase two, in psoriatic arthritis, also very effective. And you see here, ACR response is clinically significant at both the lower and the higher doses. Um, and what's interesting about Ducravacitinib is that maybe it's a little different than the other jacks in terms of safety because in the approval for psoriasis, if you look at the label approved by the FDA, it doesn't carry a lot of the baggage that the other t JAK inhibitors carry, and it doesn't recommend any laboratory monitoring. Again, really nice for dermatologists, potentially for us. All right, so let's go on another case real quick. A uh, 63-year-old guy, he's been following you for a long time. You treated him with a tanner sept. He switched after a couple years because his skin was okay. Uh, his skin was worse, and he did better without alimumab than a tanner sept for skin. He comes to you and he says, I have to switch because my sister has MS. I've been reading the label and I know that there's this link between TNF inhibitors and MS. And despite everything you tell him that that's your sister and that's not you and I would continue the same drug, he's insisted. So what do you switch him to? Kind of what I expected, neck and neck. I mean, I think many of us would go with an IL-17 inhibitor because we know it's going to get good skin response. It should be equivalent um, to a TNF inhibitor for joints. But you also know that JAK inhibitors, and particularly apatacitinib, gives you the skin response that was equivalent to adalimumab in that trial. And so maybe that would be alternative because he's done well with adalimumab. A word about toxicities, and we know all about some of this. The zosters, a big deal. The whole, and I'm not going to go through all this because Stanley took us through all this, but after the oral surveillance trial, all the issues about MACE events, malignancy, venous thrombolic events, we know about the laboratory abnormalities. I don't know if the TIC2 inhibitors are going to be different. So far, maybe. They certainly seem to have less issues in terms of lab abnormalities, whether some of this other stuff is going to be different. But I will say what we know to date is much like what uh, Stanley showed you in RA, in that the risks are primarily in the people older and already at high risk for cardiovascular disease. Okay, And we know that in that population, there's a higher risk of these cardiovascular events with JAK inhibitors, or at least with tofacitinib, um, than with TNF inhibitors. And then whether that's a unique risk of the JAK inhibitors or the, uh, the TNF inhibitors actually reduce risk in that population, we don't yet know, but it's there. And the same thing holds true in psoriatic disease. So here, again, another lady, 10 years of psoriasis. She's been doing well on opatacitinib. And her, her joints are really well. And this is something we've been coming up with in the last year all the time. She comes to you and she's been reading the news and she read how the FDA assessed the JAK inhibitors and said, they got to be after a TNF inhibitor. They're dangerous. She wants to stop taking the nupatacitin or at least wants to know if she should. How do you counsel her? I think this one has, is, a, is as close to a right answer as any of the questions I've asked you, because I think it's very clear. She's very low risk. She's doing well on a drug. I think you try your best to reassure her and say, this is the data for a population of patients that I don't know that you belong in or fit in. I'm comfortable continuing this drug. I would tell her that, and hopefully she's willing to listen and remain and continue to be under control. All right, last minute or so, just a word about um, guidelines. So years ago, Ken Gordon and I came about a way of sort of rethinking how you think about psoriatic disease. Because remember, in all these patients, you've got joints, and in most cases, you've got at least some component of skin. The most recent iteration of the GRAPA guidelines began to bring JAK inhibitors in. Now, they broke this up much, much more into all the different disease domains, um, but what they found very clearly was that for peripheral arthritis, for axial disease, the data on JAK inhibitors, if you don't 
think about safety as much. You just think about efficacy, strong recommendation in those populations of patients where those are the predominant disease manifestations. And even with enthesitis, with dactylitis, with skin disease, with uh, the only exception being nail disease where the, disease, the data isn't great, in all those diseases there's really good data to support JAK inhibitors, which leads to a strong recommendation. Um, when they looked at people who had concomitant IBD, it was a conditional recommendation, but that's before the approvals. And now that these drugs are getting approved, it's often a really nice choice for those patients, especially because the gastroenterologists are willing to go with much higher doses, and so I can sort of get out of that argument and that discussion and let them drive the therapy. All right. So to wrap this up, why are we thinking about JAK and EBS? I started with this question. Well, it works in both skin disease and joint disease. The joint efficacy in what we've seen to date is comparable to the effective biologics that we use frequently, TNF inhibitors and IL-17 inhibitors, and in fact now IL-23 inhibitors, though there's no direct comparison there either. Um, the skin may, the efficacy is probably less. It's comparable to adalimumab, which doesn't really stack up against some of the newer biologic pathways, but it works in multiple domains, including axial disease. Um, many people like oral drugs, so it gives us an option there. And the safety profile, I think, for the most part, has been reasonable until everything was sort of muddied up with the oral surveillance. But in the low-risk patients, I think it's still a very reasonable safety profile. And the last bullet is really a question we have yet to answer. And it's, it, you know, based so far, it looks like it's going to be different, but that may open up TIC2 inhibitors as a really um, nice pathway because it does look like the at least the toxicity profile may be different than the rest of the jack and head. The prevalence of psoriatic arthritis in women of reproductive age, a couple of references we can look at in, just in the general population uh, suggest that 0.19% uh, of, of adults in Europe may have uh, psoriatic arthritis with a range of 0.16 to 0.32%. Uh, and then another study in the Middle East suggested a lower prevalence, 0.01%, uh, with an upper bound of the confidence interval of 0.17%. Thought to equally affect women and men, uh, onset often between 30 and 50 years of age, which uh, overlaps reproductive years, at least at the upper end of the range uh, for women. Uh, so certainly a possibility that women with psoriatic arthritis will become pregnant. So there's one study, um, and this is pretty uh, tiny to read, uh, that came out of a national inpatient database in the U.S., uh, covering a few years up to 2014, looking at per 100,000 pregnancies, so this is in pregnancy, uh, the number of, of patients with psoriatic arthritis or a diagnosis of that. And you can see uh, in 2014, it's nine per 100,000, so about a tenth of what we saw in the general population, so it's not a very common uh, disease in pregnancy. Interestingly, the uh, this this rate in pregnancy seemed to uh, 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 track up you know, starting in 2011, and I don't know what that is due to. Um, the clinical course of psoriatic arthritis in pregnancy, um, there are limited data, uh, but the paper that I uh, distributed for the pre-read uh, was a, a nice, I think, systematic review uh, uh, by Meisner et al., uh, published in 2021, uh, and they looked at a, a, a big um, survey of the literature and came up with 13 eligible publications uh, that included 2,332 pregnancies, so that's... Uh, I mean, it's amazing that there's so few, but that's what was uh, encompassed in this uh, systematic review with psoriatic arthritis. And of those nine studies, uh, including 536 pregnancies, uh, actually had uh, included in the, in the study something on disease activity, which I think is critical, and you'll see that's a theme throughout this talk. Uh, about two-thirds um, across those nine studies were thought to have mild disease, um, and one-third moderate to severe disease. Um, the data overall uh, from this systematic review indicated lo little evidence of a, a huge change in disease activity during pregnancy compared to prior to pregnancy, uh, but the data more strongly suggested that disease activity may increase uh, postpartum. And the caveat was that across these nine studies, disease activity was not uniformly measured um, it, uh, in, in these reports.
So uh, a figure in that uh, paper uh, is shown here. Um, and these were three studies uh, that specifically looked at separating out um, uh, arthritic uh, disease activity and psoriasis d disease activity. Um, the dark bar showing um, an increase in disease activity in pregnancy prior, uh, compared to prior to pregnancy, and the uh, gray hashed bar showing an increase in disease activity in the postpartum period compared to pregnancy. So you can see the, the take home message here is that there seems to be evidence that this increase in disease activity is much more prominent. Um, even though these sample sizes are small uh, in the postpartum period. So something to be aware of. Um, in terms of risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes uh, in pregnancies complicated by psoriatic arthritis, um, in that same systematic review, uh, nine studies assessed adverse pregnancy outcomes. And their take home or their conclusion um, by Meisner et al. Uh, was that they did not think there was strong evidence for an increased risk for gestational diabetes uh, in pregnancy uh, in women with, uh, with psoriatic arthritis or small for gestational age infants, so that's defined as less than the 10th percentile uh, for gestational age at the time of delivery and sex of the infant, so on the smaller end of the range. And then they didn't think there was uh, strong evidence for an increased risk for low birth weight, defined as about 5 pounds, 5 ounces, or 2,500 grams, irrespective of gestational age. Uh, they did think uh, that there was evidence uh, for increased risks, um, at least uh, some evidence that didn't rule out uh, increased risk for uh, preeclampsia, uh, so a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, uh, for uh, delivery by cesarean section, particularly elective uh, delivery, and they felt that there was some evidence uh, for an increased risk of preterm delivery, but the data kind of went in two different directions. So the figure uh, that was included in this paper, and I'm going to look at this because I can't possibly read that tiny print up there, um, uh, is not re uh, a meta-analysis. Uh, so you're not seeing a summary odds ratio or uh, risk ratio for each one of these outcomes. Uh, but what you are seeing is for the three to five studies that they were able to include in this, uh, how, they, how they fell out in terms of the point estimate for the odds ratio or the relative risk and the 95% confidence interval. So looking at preeclampsia, you can see that there are two studies uh, that showed a modest increased risk, 1.2 four or uh, thereabouts and 2.3 or thereabouts uh, for preeclampsia and two that suggested no increased risk or no significant increased risk. Um, but uh, again, I stress that it's a modest increased risk. The baseline rate of preeclampsia in the general population is about three or four percent. Uh, gestational diabetes, no statistically significant increased risk for any of the three studies that were included. Um, for C-section, if you move over to the far right, elective C-section, you can see two studies show a modest increased risk of about uh, 50 percent, uh, and one that showed no increased risk. Uh, so that's where they pulled their conclusion that C-section, especially elective C-section, uh, there was evidence for increased risk. For preterm birth, it's a little bit, I, I mean, I look at that and think that it, there's evidence that there's an increased risk of preterm birth, although we have a couple of studies uh, among the five where the increased risk is not uh, statistically significant. Uh, but again, modest increased risk. These are, you know, in the 20 to 70 percent increased risk range and not, you know, three, fourfold. Uh, for small for gestational age, really three out of the four studies didn't show any evidence of an increased risk, and for low birth weight, uh, neither study was statistically significant. So, um, Moving on to uh, uh, individual studies, uh, this is a paper coming from the Swedish National Register, uh, 2007 to 2017, and you're probably familiar with this. This is a population-based register where 99% of the population is included in it. it. Granted, it's Sweden, so the size of the, uh, the number of births in Sweden are the same as in San Diego, California. So it's a small population, but it's a, it's a complete population. Uh, so they identified 921 pregnancies with psoriatic arthritis, uh, 
and they match them uh, uh, one to ten uh, to those without uh, psoriatic arthritis matched on maternal age, year of delivery, and parity. So they had 9,210 9, in the comparison group. And they found, this is uh, uh, Ramaeus et al. Uh, is the first author on this. They found that women with psoriatic arthritis compared to those without were more likely to be obese, uh, to smoke, and to have pregestational hypertension and pregestational type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So four risk factors for adverse pregnancy outcome that seem to ride along uh, with having psoriatic arthritis. Uh, they concluded that there were increased risks for preterm delivery. Uh, the adjusted odds ratio they came up with was 1.69, with a lower bound of the confidence interval 1.27. So again, a modest increased risk, uh, but significant. And for cesarean section delivery overall, as we just heard in the systematic review, uh, with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.77 and a lower bound of 1.43. Again, a modest increased risk. Uh, they did, uh, uh, I think what was useful uh, in this paper, and uh, it really worth reading, uh, they stratified on treatment. Uh, so they had 495 who had uh, no indication of treatment with uh, conventional therapies or glucocorticoids one year prior to and during pregnancy, um, and 496 who had treatment either in the year prior to pregnancy or during pregnancy or both. And um, in this analysis, there are several tables uh, that cover the outcomes that they looked at, and I'm going to focus on preterm birth. Uh, so in this table, they compared non-psoriatic uh, arthritis pregnancies to psoriatic arthritis pregnancies without treatment in the year before or uh, during pregnancy. And you can see uh, that it's only medically indicated preterm birth, uh, so there would have to be a reason like uh, poor fetal growth or uh, severe preeclampsia that would uh, 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 have an indicated uh, preterm delivery, uh, where they saw a statistic statistically significant increased risk for preterm birth. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, the point estimates, although above one for overall preterm birth, were not statistically significant. Uh, then when they compared pregnancies with treatment, uh, they did find statistically significant increased risks uh, for preterm birth compared to non-psoriatic arthritis pregnancies of about twofold, um, and this was uh, true uh, pretty much across the board. Um, and the, the conclusion they drew, and I, I think uh, is reasonable, is that those who are receiving treatment as compared to those who received no treatment in those two years, the pregnancy year and the year before, likely had more severe underlying disease. Um, and in this, uh, another table from this uh, uh, paper, uh, they compared non-psoriatic uh, arthritis pregnancies to those who had treatment only before pregnancy, so only in that, that year before pregnancy. So now we're getting down to smaller sample sizes. So there was 170 in that group. And you can see the adjusted odds ratios here are now uh, attenuated, and there is no statistical significance for any of the preterm birth outcomes for those who were treated only before before pregnancy, and then when they looked at the 256 who had treatment during pregnancy, irrespective of what the treatment was, here you can see that the adjusted odds ratios on the far right column uh, suggest the increased risk is there with those who either continued into pregnancy or had pregnancy exposure. Again, suggesting that those who continued uh, treatment into pregnancy may have had more severe disease, and thus that's why they continued. And then uh, the last table I'll show from this paper uh, is looking at uh, stratifying on the type of treatment. And so here we're looking at psoriatic arthritis pregnancies with non-biologic DMARD treatment, so they were receiving conventional therapy or glucocorticoids um, com uh, compared to the non-psoriatic arthritis pregnancies. Again, if even further attenuation, there's really no evidence here of, of any uh, note of an increased risk for preterm delivery. 
uh, for those on the non-biologic DMARD treatment. But when we look at those on the biologic DMARD treatment on the far two right columns, uh, you can see that even though we're down to it, again, a smaller sample size, uh, slicing and dicing with 103 in that group, um, that the adjusted odds ratios are substantially higher. So we're talking in the three to five fold increased risk for preterm delivery in those who are being treated with biologic DMARDs. And again, the, the interpretation of this um, it certainly can be that those who are being treated or channeled into receiving biologic DMARDs in pregnancy uh, are those with the most severe um, underlying disease. So moving on to uh, risks for preterm delivery in um, other covariates in this sample, they didn't put this in a table, so I'm just going to describe this. Um, they stratified on parity, uh, meaning that they looked at uh, individuals with psoriatic arthritis or not, uh, who were this was their first pregnancy um, versus a, a, a second or, or, or um, other uh, uh, future pregnancy. And they found that the risk for preterm delivery was really not only most pronounced, but it was pretty much restricted to first pregnancies in this analysis. And there's actually another paper that's reported the same thing. Um, and they found that those uh, who discontinued biologic treatment in those first pregnancies prior to pregnancy uh, were ones who had the, the highest risk of preterm delivery. So again, sliced and diced down to smaller numbers, but it's really intriguing to think about this, that in a first pregnancy, you know, are women more inclined to be more conservative about not wanting to continue medication, even though they may have disease that is, is uh, more active, um, and that's the reason why there was an increased risk. Um, the, it's intriguing to speculate about first pregnancies as well. Um, so we've reported before that, you know, and, and others have as well, that uh, um, preterm delivery uh, certainly can be mediated by preeclampsia. Uh, so if the mom has uh, preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension, that in turn is a big risk factor for preterm delivery. And first pregnancies are at substantial increased risk for preeclampsia. So maybe that's uh, the pathway by which this, uh, this may you know, be explained. Um, it, it's important to note that there was no assessment of disease activity um, in this study. And then others who commented on the study said it was unclear what the indication was for the biologics being prescribed. So was it for psoriatic arthritis or what? Um, another paper that actually preceded this one, and there's probably some overlapping data, uh, was from uh, both Sweden and a Denmark uh, National Register uh, from 2006 to 2018. A smaller number, 489 psoriatic arthritis pregnancies, matched again 1 to 10 on maternal age, parity, and birth year. Um, and they found an increased risk of preeclampsia um, in that analysis, an adjusted odds ratio of 1.85, so a modest increased risk, but statistically significant. And they, they looked at uh, just generically described maternal monotherapy treatment before pregnancy was associated with a further increased risk for preeclampsia. 2.72 odds ratio, and maternal monotherapy treatment during pregnancy associated with an elevated risk, uh, but uh, the confidence interval overlapped one. Uh, and then last, uh, uh, GANG-B, the, uh, the healthcare uh, cost and utilization project that I showed earlier for the prevalence of psoriatic arthritis in pregnancy. This is a national inpatient sample, uh, 2004 to 2014. They had 419 pregnancies with psoriatic arthritis, which they compared to everyone else, so 9 million without. And they found, as, has, as we saw before, that women with psoriatic arthritis were more likely to be older, uh, obese, um, so risk factors for adverse pregnancy outcomes, but, but in, in this inpatient sample, more, we're more likely to be white, have higher income, and be privately insured. And in their analysis, uh, they really found very little evidence of uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes. The one thing they did note on the, the, the first row in this table is that there was a significant, although modest, 1.5-fold increased risk for pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, each of the other um, adverse outcomes that they looked